Hello, fellow neuroscience enthusiasts. This video is another installment of the Brain Preservation Foundation's Journal Club, in which we briefly review the results of a selected paper and discuss its relevance to the ongoing debate regarding brain preservation. Today's paper is entitled Synapse Specific Representation of the Identity of Overlapping Memory Engrams by Abdu et al. It was published in the journal Science on June 15, 2018. A link to the paper is listed below. This is really a fantastic paper that I highly recommend reading. It combines a whole range of today's most powerful techniques. For example, memory engram tagging using immediate early genes, optogenetics, and optical LTP and LTD, and more. And it uses these to get at the heart of a major question in neuroscience, namely how memories are encoded physically in the brain. Unfortunately, I will only be able to cover a fraction of what is in the paper, so please do try to read the full paper yourself. Also, please note that although I will try to do my best to accurately relate the research, it is always possible that I may misinterpret something crucial. And if I do, please let me know in the comments and I will try to correct it. This paper is just one of a plethora of papers that we will be covering that seek to determine how memories are physically stored in the brain. The particular memory studied by Abdu et al. was auditory fear conditioning in mice. This diagram from the Lido Lab website gives an overview. In auditory fear conditioning, a tone is played for about 20 seconds and while the tone is still playing, the mouse's feet are electrically shocked by the cage it is living in. Even a single event like this will create a long-lasting fear memory in the mouse. If that tone is played again many days later, the mouse will freeze its activity in a manner that appears it is anticipating being shocked again. A few things to note. The tone is referred to as the conditioned stimulus, or CS. The shock is referred to as the unconditioned stimulus, or US. This type of conditioning paradigm where the US overlaps the CS is called delay conditioning, and it's thought to be learned directly in the amygdala by detecting the overlapping firing of auditory and pain sensory neurons. This is shown in this diagram from Marin 2017 which depicts a single amygdala cell which receives a direct excitation from the U.S. shock, as well as a host of other sensory inputs. Anticipating the Abdu results, these axons labeled CS plus might derive from the auditory cortex and signal a 7 kilohertz tone. And these axons might signal a 2 kilohertz tone that has never been paired with a shock. During conditioning, the amygdala cell is activated by the strong U.S. stimulus, while the much weaker CS plus axons are simultaneously firing. This coincidence causes long-term potentiation in these synapses, which even days later allows the amygdala neuron to become active when stimulated only by the 7 kilohertz tone. And activation of this amygdala neuron causes freezing behavior via its projections to output areas of the amygdala. By the way, if instead the U.S. shock is delivered some time after the CS tone shuts off, then it is called trace conditioning, and such learning requires the hippocampus as well as the amygdala. Auditory fear conditioning is one of the best studied examples of memory in neuroscience, and I intend to cover it in much more detail in other journal clubs. But for now, I will simply point out that Joseph Ledeau's lab has produced several excellent review papers on the emotional memory circuits in the amygdala, and he has written one of the best neuroscience books on the synaptic basis of memory, enticingly titled Synaptic Self. I highly recommend these resources for those interested in more details. A key question that is addressed by the Abdu paper is how this simple system handles the learning of many separate memories. Their result suggests that each fear memory is typically stored by a distinct subset of cells in the lateral amygdala. 
To help visualize this, I have depicted here six neurons in the lateral amygdala, all of which are receiving projections from auditory brain regions. All inputs are connected to the lateral amygdala cells via small, weak synapses. When a shock occurs, only a randomly chosen subset of lateral amygdala cells becomes active. It is a fascinating question how this occurs. From what I have read, it seems that there is always inhibitory competition among lateral amygdala cells that enforces that only a particular fraction can become active at any given time. If none are driven strongly by previously learned sensory inputs, then the subset that becomes active is determined by differences in their intrinsic excitability. And this intrinsic excitability of the cells apparently changes on a day-to-day -day basis, producing a different random subset each day. If a 2 kilohertz tone is sounding at the same time as this unconditioned stimulus shock occurs, then the synapses that connect the two become strengthened. This is how an auditory fear memory is thought to be encoded. Let's go through some terminology. These lateral amygdala cells are said to be the engram cells associated with this memory. This subset is often referred to as a neuronal ensemble encoding the memory. These synapses that strengthen to encode the memory are often referred to as the synaptic ensemble encoding the memory. Now, if days later the mouse hears a 2 kilohertz auditory tone, it will freeze because the strengthened synapses will now be strong enough to allow the auditory tone alone to activate the lateral amygdala engram cells, thereby releasing their downstream freezing effects. If on a separate day a 7 kilohertz tone is paired with a shock, then a different set of engram cells will activate to store this new memory, and a different set of synapses will be strengthened. We visualize the entire network storing these two separate memories here. These synapses and cells store the 2 kilohertz fear memory, and these synapses and cells store the 7 kilohertz memory. Now, there has been a mild controversy recently regarding whether it is proper to say that the memory is really being stored in the synapses or in the engram cells. And in this simple example above, each memory is being stored by separate synapses and separate uh, engram cells. So this really doesn't address the debate. The Abdu paper came up with a brilliant way to show that it really was the synapses that should be considered to be storing the separate memories. They did this by forming two separate fear memories using different ensembles of synapses, but using the same engram cells. Then they showed that they could completely erase one of the memories without affecting the other memory. In order to test this, they started with a CFOS TTA mouse line. These mice were developed in Mark Mayford's lab in 2007 and have become indispensable in a wide range of memory experiments. If you feed these mice a diet containing doxycycline, then nothing happens. But if you stop feeding them doxycycline for a couple of days, then a marker gene of your choosing can be expressed only in those neurons that are highly active during that short time period. CFOS is an immediate early gene protein that will bind to the FOS promoter here. This turns on expression of TTA. The mice have another transgenic sequence which includes a TET-O promoter region. The, TET, uh, the TTA expressed would turn on this TET-O promoter but it cannot because this TTA is inactive in the presence of doxycycline. But when the mouse is taken off doxycycline, the expression of TTA can bind the TET-O promoter. 
and which, uh, which turns on the expression of a marker gene, in this case, tau lax z. Crucially, another, z, another gene is also turned on by the tet o promoter. This is a form of TTA called TTA star that is not dependent on the absence of doxycycline. Once this TTA star expression is turned on, it latches on the expression of the marker gene from that point on. When the mouse is put back on the doxycycline diet, those cells that were active during the dox off period retain this gene expression, marking them permanently. The authors inject a pair of adeno-associated viruses, AAVs, into the auditory regions of the mouse's brain, specifically the auditory cortex and the medial part of the medial geniculate nucleus of the thalamus. The first virus contains TRE3G CRE, which will express CRE recombinase only in the presence of TTA expression. The second virus contains the channel rhodopsin variant CHIEF, which is a fast optogenetic channel. And this virus is constructed such that uh, CHIEF is only expressed in the presence of CRE. Long story short, only those neurons that are active during the off dox period will come to express optogenetic channels. And these tagged sensory engram cells can be reactivated at any point in the future simply by pulsing them with laser light. Here is part of figure number one from the Abdu paper. The mouse is raised on a doxycycline diet, dox, and habituated to two kilohertz tones. Then the mouse is taken off dox for two days and given a conditioning session where it hears a seven kilohertz tone followed by a foot shock. This succeeds in tagging the sensory engram cells that represent the seven kilohertz tone. This is shown here in fluorescence. And crucially, it not only expresses optogenetic channels in its cell bodies, but it also expresses optogenetic channels in the axon terminals of these cells that innervate the lateral amygdala. On day seven, they tested this optogenetic expression by pulsing laser light at 10 hertz directly onto the lateral amygdala to activate these uh, terminals from, that are coming from the uh, sensory areas of the brain. The result is that the mouse freezes just as it would if a real seven kilohertz tone was being heard. Now, the authors did a number of additional tests and controls that I don't have time to go into here. But one that is important is that they injected a powerful amnesic cocktail uh, listed here as Annie plus TBC. Uh, or they injected a control that was just a phosphate buffer. buffer. And they, they injected this on day five overlapping another presentation of the 7 kilohertz tone without a foot shock, just the presentation of the 7 kilohertz tone. Now, other papers have shown that such a reactivation of a memory makes it disposed to being erased. And if, the, if an amnesic drug is delivered during this time uh, when a memory is being recalled, then it can specifically erase this recalled fear memory. The ANI plus TBC uh, prevents protein synthesis and it degrades some existing proteins involved in long-term potentiation of synapses. And indeed, when this amnesic cocktail was delivered to the lateral amygdala on day five, overlapping this seven kilohertz recall of the fear memory, it did succeed in completely erasing the long-term fear memory, both behaviorally and as expressed via optogenetic stimulation. It is also important to note that the authors showed that they could also label the lateral amygdala engram cells directly 
and this allowed them to show that if two auditory fear memories are learned within five hours of each other, they share engram cells. This is the figure associated with this experiment using the CFOS TTA system again, and in this case, a viral vector containing a Cre dependent fluorescent protein M cherry. The authors labeled the lateral amygdala cells associated with the 7 kHz fear memory. They then did the following experiment. The mouse was conditioned with a 7 kHz tone and a paired shock on day 4 while off docks. This permanently labeled the lateral amygdala engram cells in red using the M cherry. Then, either five hours later or for separate mice, 24 hours later, the mouse was conditioned with a 2 kilohertz tone and a paired shock while on docks. Crucially, the mouse was immediately, only one and a half hours later, sacrificed by perfusion fixation. This locked in the most recent CFOS expression, meaning that the authors could compare the first engram cell population labeled with red M cherry versus the second engram cell population, which was visualized by staining for CFOS expression. And here is the crucial figure. When M cherry versus CFOS expression is compared, for the five hour separation, they saw a lot of overlap between the two engram cell populations. But with the 24 hour separation, they saw almost no overlap in the engram cell populations. This overlap is quantified here at 60% for the five hour versus only 20% for the 24 hour overlap. It should of course be noted that 60% overlap is not 100%, and this difference might be important when evaluating the implications to come. This manipulation set them up for their crucial experiment. They conditioned a 7 kHz fear memory, and then five hours later conditioned a 2 kHz fear memory. And from their previous results, they interpret this as having created two memories that share a common set of engram cells in the lateral amygdala, but that are encoded by two distinct set of synapses, as shown in this figure from the paper. Then they either erased the memory associated with the 7 kHz tone, or they erased the memory associated with the 2 kHz tone. And they show that erasure of the 7 kilohertz memory does not affect the 2 kilohertz memory. And that erasure of the 2 kilohertz memory does not affect the 7 kilohertz memory. This result supports the model that the memory is being stored in the synapses themselves. And that is the key thing that they were, uh, that they were questioning. If, conversely, the memory was somehow being stored mainly in the engram cells, the fact that the two memories shared a majority of engram cells in common would have predicted that erasing one would erase, or at least severely degrade, the other memory. And this is not what was seen. This brief overview of the Abdu et al. paper has covered only a tiny fraction of the experiments and controls that they performed. Notably, they also performed a set of optical LTP and LTD experiments that replicate this main finding in a quite distinct fashion. Anyone interested in the details should really read the Abdu paper themselves. I highly recommend it since it elegantly combines a range of today's most powerful techniques to get to the heart of a major question in neuroscience, namely how memories are encoded physically in the brain. Let me finish up by reading a section from the conclusion of the Abdu et al. paper. Quote, This study uncovered the mechanism by which the brain can maintain the uniqueness of a massive number of associated memories stored in shared cell ensembles. Furthermore, we achieved selective and total erasure of a fear memory from an engram network 
without affecting other memories stored in the shared ensemble by resetting the plasticity in a synapse-specific manner. These findings lead to a better understanding of the mechanisms underlying memory storage and may give insight into therapeutic approaches to treating post-traumatic stress disorder. Now let me very briefly address the relevance of this particular paper to the ongoing brain preservation debate. A concern I often hear expressed is that we know almost nothing about how memories are encoded by neural circuits. Therefore, we cannot even begin to discuss whether today's preservation techniques might support the possibility of future memory decoding. Of course, no single neuroscience result can adequately address such an open-ended objection. Only a thorough review of the last 50 years of research could even attempt to do that. And the whole collection of these Journal Club videos are designed to take a stab at doing just that. Nonetheless, I think the paper we just reviewed uh, does address this question, at least in a small way, in that it lends new support to the theory that at least some types of memory are encoded physically in the brain through the strengthening of synaptic connections. According to this paper's results, we could theoretically determine whether a particular mouse was conditioned to fear a 2 kilohertz tone, or if it was conditioned to fear a 7 kilohertz tone by carefully examining the synaptic connections that auditory cortex projections make onto lateral amygdala cells. And according to many other papers that we will be discussing in future journal clubs, there is plenty of evidence suggesting that the strength of a synaptic connection is correlated with its ultrastructural features and with its ion channel and receptor protein densities features that are known to be preserved in a glutaraldehyde-fixed brain. Say we wish to determine whether a particular animal had been conditioned to fear a 7 kHz tone or a 2 kHz tone, and that we wish to determine this based only on the animal's glutaraldehyde-preserved brain. If we could obtain a map of its neural circuitry at the resolution typical of electron microscopy, then we could trace the auditory sensory circuits from the tonotopically organized cochlear nucleus through the midbrain nuclei to the medial geniculate nucleus and on to the auditory cortex. Tracing this pattern of synaptic connectivity, it should be possible to determine which cells in the auditory cortex respond selectively to 2 kHz and which respond selectively to 7 kHz. And then, tracing the axons of these sensory cells further into the amygdala, we could theoretically determine the number and strengths of synaptic connections they make onto lateral amygdala cells, which should provide us the information we need to determine whether the animal had been conditioned to fear a 2 kHz or a 7 kHz tone. In fact, performing such an experiment today is almost within reach, given our advanced labeling and imaging techniques and I believe it offers a small counterexample to those who claim that we know nothing about how memories are encoded, and to those that claim that decoding memories from a preserved brain will forever be out of reach. Thank you for listening, and thank you for keeping an open mind regarding what advances in neuroscience might bring in the future. These videos are designed to spark conversation and debate, so please feel free to leave comments below. I look forward to reading them.